Good evening. I started out as a theoretical physicist, as my friend mentioned, and ended up as a dean of admissions because they couldn't find a real one at Boston College, and that's the absolute uh, verifiable truth. At the same time I was passaging from uh, the physics department to the admissions office, I was also chairman of a local school committee, and uh, elected in my 20s, chairman in my, at 30. Uh, and I was also, somewhat later, uh, a trustee of the College Board. From all those perspectives, I got to wonder about how education in this country was working, both uh, at, uh, at the higher education level, colleges and universities, but also in terms of teacher training and how that filtered down into elementary and secondary education. And over the years, I've had the privilege of trying to understand this as a systems problem, which it really is, and I had access to some rather extraordinary data provided to me by the College Board with the understanding that uh, if the results were controversial, I would not be able to publish that data. The data was not published, although I, I shared it rather broadly, especially when I became a trustee of the College Board. Uh, but what it showed, uh, regrettably, and I say this even though five of our eight children uh, uh, have degrees in education from colleges and universities, uh, is that the, uh, the teaching profession, for the most part, with many notable exceptions, uh, doesn't have the very best people teaching our children in this country. And to me, that is one of the two or three major crises that we face. Uh, in the process of looking at how we admit students to colleges and universities, and we work countries around the world, uh, in the process of understanding how we make uh, the uh, 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 compromises to admit students to schools of education around the world, including the School of Education at Boston College, I came to understand a little bit better how all this works. Uh, but in the process of beginning to really write on the subject, I was looking uh, at uh, measures of inequality when I got a call from uh, a friend of mine uh, who is works for our company and is based in Cambridge, England. And he said, there's a book out. You've got to read this book. And I got a copy of this book, The Spirit Level. And it is easily the most dog-eared book I've ever owned. I've got <laughs> half the pages turned over, everything circled. I've made uh, incredible amounts of notes on this. I've looked at all the criticisms of the book uh, and, 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 and uh, I feel very comfortable that I understand exactly what uh, Professor Wilkinson is talking about. I invited him to come to the United States uh, at, in, in the greater Boston area, and, and he's here this week as the guest of McGuire Associates and Linda and me, and uh, it's been wonderful getting to know him as a friend. He's an extraordinarily kind, uh, gentle, soft-spoken, unlike some people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, must be, it must be something to do with the Boston College connection. Um, we tend to be more type A, I think Richard's more type B, but he has some extraordinary uh, data and insights to share with you that I think are going to have a, a, a major uh, impact on the United States. On January 1st, Nicholas Kristof wrote a op-ed piece in the New York Times featuring the book, this book, The Spirit Level and what it was trying to tell us. We now see on the streets of New York and the streets of Boston a beginning uh, uh, of an understanding, a crescendo, the snowball is rolling down the hill on an understanding that more than taxes, more even than jobs, which are an important effect of what we're hearing about, is this issue of income inequality. Uh, I have one data point uh, that, that, that has astonished me, and that is that over the, over the last generation, approximately $20 trillion, that's with a T, has moved from the bottom 90% over the upper class, the 2 to 10% group that Barry referred to, to the top 1%. And that's probably irreversible <coughs> movement that's been, uh, that's been translated into all kinds of things, huge houses, who's going to own the first billion dollar house, multiple yachts, airplanes, et cetera, land, and some good work too. As a result, uh, we see uh, 
transfer about one to two percent of that twenty trillion dollars back into endowments in higher education, and those endowments have fueled all kinds of good things. But disproportionately, uh, the sand has been uh, brought to the beach. That is, the, the wealthiest fifty institutions in this country have benefited from that endowment ultra disproportionately. So, in thinking about all this and inequality. Uh, I'm astounded by what I learned from this book, uh, particularly from all those different perspectives I've mentioned as a mathematician, dean of admissions, a faculty member, school committee chair, trustee of the college board, consultant for colleges and universities, uh, and I met my match by a long shot uh, with Richard Wilkinson, so let me introduce Richard. He's played a formative role in international research on the social determinants of health and on the social societal effects of income inequality. He studied economic history at the London School of Economics before training in epidemiology. He's a professor emeritus of social epidemiology at the University of Nottingham Medical School, honorary professor at University <coughs> College London, and a visiting professor at the University of York. He also, and this is very important and a major interest of uh, my wife and mine because we among other things, have a disabled child, and you saw what disability can do to you. He's also a co-founder of the Equality Trust, an independent organization conducting an evidence-based campaign to reduce income inequality in, a, in order to improve quality of life. He's best known for this book, which I commend to everyone, a uh, 2009 book with his partner, Kate Pickett, called The Spirit Level in which he argues that societies with more equal distribution of incomes have better health outcomes than ones in which the gap between richest and poorest parts of society is greater. The book is a bestseller in the UK and several other European countries and is now available in 20 languages, including English here tonight. <laughs> so I, I should also mention, to embarrass him even further, that Arnold Toynbee's granddaughter, Polly, who's a gifted writer for The Guardian, refers to Richard, uh, and he would say somewhat hyperbolically, as the 21st century Charles Darwin. So with that. And